Today is all about the get rich quick schemes and actually how to not be a victim of investment scams and how to actually avoid them. Hello and welcome to the Neighborhood Money Podcast, a video podcast all about money and helping you build a life you deserve. Hey, we're Kevin and Drew, and we're here each and every week to talk to you all about growing your wealth. And Drew, one thing that we do each and every week is that we try to teach and provide that knowledge around growing your wealth over time, and we avoid all of those get rich quick schemes. And I bring that up because today is all about the get rich quick schemes and actually how to not be a victim of investment scams and how to actually avoid them. And Drew, I, you put together a fantastic list of like seven or eight different types of common investment scams that we're going to walk through today. So I'm really looking forward to it. And man, it, it, it's going to be a lot of fun because we don't really touch this type of stuff that often. Yeah. I've always been kind of interested in a lot of these scams. I remember in college, I was going to some seminars about people that were fraudsters. And I, I've always been intrigued by scams and frauds because they tend to be extremely intelligent people that always find a loophole and they're very good at selling these type of products. So it always uh, just, it, it always kind of intrigues me. And I even think of like the movie, uh, Cat, was it Catch Me If You Can with Leonardo, Leonardo oh, yeah. DiCaprio? Right. And, you know, just how he was able to pretty much scam his way and through life. And then once he gets caught, the FBI actually wanted to hire him because <laughs> the best person for yeah. a fraud job would be a fraudster. Exactly. Exactly. So, so really excited to dive in, uh, and, you know, talk about some of the scams. So we'll talk about what are some of the warning signs for investment scams. Uh, we'll go through your list Drew, that you put together around those common, uh, those common scams that exist out there. And then we'll also talk through how not to actually get scammed and some of our thoughts around that. Uh, before we dive into the episode, uh, if you are new here, welcome. We, we love to have you come in and listen to our podcast. But if you guys get any value out of this podcast, please consider putting a five-star review out on Apple Podcast. That helps us a whole lot. Provide that review. Let us know what you guys love about this podcast. Also, if you're watching over on YouTube, consider subscribing to our channel and liking this video specifically because that helps it get pushed out to more and more people. Also, drop us a comment in the comment section, either, you know, what you like about this episode, other future topics that you want to hear it really, or just, if you just want to drop by and say, hi, you know, we welcome all of that stuff, but you know, without further ado, Drew, let's dive mm -hmm. right into investment scams. And actually let's start with what are some of those warning signs of investment scams? So the list, list I have here, the first thing starting out is you tend to see promising very low risk and very high returns. And that is kind of a red flag right there because when you think about high returns, you always think about a high risk. So it just doesn't make sense for there to be such low risk and such high returns. And when you see that red flag right away, you have to get your ears perked up and see what the heck is actually going on here? <laughs> I always have my rule of thumb be in the S and P 500 because to me that's a fairly low risk investment, specifically because it's got decades of experience. And so when I think about an S and P 500 index return, it's roughly between eight and ten percent, depending on you know when you're looking at the what time period you're looking at. And then if you're looking at, you know, post inflation numbers or whatnot, but so that eight to 10% to me is kind of my baseline around how much risk should in, be in an investment. Oh, excuse me. How much risk should be in an investment? And so, you know, we'll get into it in a little bit, but you know, some of the crypto stuff that's saying like, Hey, we're going to give you 20% 
risk free, basically. Yeah, that stuff's just not going to fly. And so trying to keep that baseline and as you get more and more comfortable with the different types of investments that are out there, you'll start to get that sense of like, hey, OK, I know that maybe this investment is saying I'm going to make 50 to 20 percent, but that's probably pretty risky. And so you probably don't want to put something in there that you're not willing to lose. So if we're going on to a second warning sign, we should say uh, it's you're contacted out of the blue. And I think some people have probably seen that on, say, their phone. They've seen text messages saying, oh, your God, Amazon package is here. Yep. Just click this link to confirm pretty much. or <laughs> It's something like that or it got lost. Click this. So being contacted out of the blue is another big red flag. There's with a technology and all, you might be seeing a lot of email marketing and they might yeah. find ways to get your email and get out there and they try selling your product. And if you look into some of those, some of those won't be scams. But if they're coming really out of the blue, they're promising something, it's a really strange name, uh, sometimes they can actually look really professional. So if it is something out of the blue that you didn't reach out for initially, that's when you have to at least start looking more into it. The one that really bothers me right now is in the social media space. So if you're like Drew or myself, we follow a bunch of different financial influencers, financial, uh, uh, social um, people that have social presences. But on their social platforms, you'll get people in the comments that say, if you need investment advice, like call this number, or if you want this type of return, here's my WhatsApp. Like, I know that that's pretty obvious. It's a scam, but unfortunately it does work and it does happen. Otherwise they, people wouldn't do it. And so just be aware that, you know, even in the newer spaces like social media, uh, um, specifically like when we start getting into more or if crypto becomes more apparent in our world, like these types of things are going to be more apparent and probably they're going to get more sophisticated and smarter. So you just have to stay vigilant. They will probably get more sophisticated. They always tend to get more sophisticated. Uh, I, I even think about, I think a lot of this episode was going to be kind of wrapped around stuff you see on TV. Cause I like to bring it back to that. I like to watch a lot of content. <laughs> yeah. So well, they're like, good stories that way, right? Great stories. So when you're thinking of being these scams could get more and more sophisticated. I even think of like the drug cartel when I can't remember what movie that was. It's it's like, they're always one step ahead of the U S and it's like these drug cartels are making submarines. It's like, how the heck can they make submarines? <laughs> so they'll put stuff in like things that look exactly like bananas and they're not bananas. So I think they're always going to be one step ahead. And I think it's cause they have very expendable people <laughs> and, and you'll see in, in, Twitter, one of the biggest things right now are bots. And so that's a huge one. And those are kind of some of those huge, annoying, unsolicited, unsolicited tactics. You know, another warning sign, Drew, is high pressure tactics. You know, it's it's act now or forever hold your peace. You know, you'll never have this greatest opportunity of all time ever again. And it's kind of funny that these types of greatest opportunities come up like almost every single day. Uh, but <laughs> jokes aside, like ha those high pressure tactics, they do work because it, it brings up an emotion inside of you. It's, it's like when you go to the store and you see like the, sh the clothes rack that's on sale, like act now 50% off. It's like, I don't know why I'm going to go buy five of them where actually this is a tactic to get you to buy more. It's the same thing in the investment world. Yeah. And it can be very, very persuasive. As you said, Kevin, emotional emotions get into it. And when you're working in very high pressure, very fast, rapid decision-making, you don't have time to sit back and think. And if they're able to sell it well on the front end and they're saying you have to decide now, otherwise this offer is gone, you kind of just can panic and just say, all right, let's do it. And that's never good. And it's kind of weird when I'm thinking these high pressure tactics now in our economy, I look at people buying homes right now or buying oh, yeah. vehicles mm -hmm. and you just get very scammy vibes from <laughs> our, econ our economy right now where it goes, if you don't put in a if you want to see the house, you have to see it before it gets listed or day gets listed. You have to put an offer in day of, and you're going to be bidding. So you have to go, you have to bid high and they'll tell you you have to bid high. So it's kind of funny, just that correlation where the, the real estate or buying lawnmowers or vehicles or like our economy is never in that high pressure tactic. And now it's getting there and it makes me 
not want to buy anything because it's like it's high pressure. I don't want to go in and buy something that I can't fully vet. I always have the rule of thumb. If they're not willing to allow you to at least think about it for 48 hours, then you should run as fast as you can the other direction. Uh, because if they don't let you take two days to think it through, it, uh, yeah, it's it's just pretty scammy, uh, to say the least. I like that rule of thumb. 48 hours, and if it's before that, then get out of there. So Drew, another warning sign is, you know, this is even more apparent now and specifically probably in the last couple of decades as the technology has advanced. But in new investment spaces, you get a lot of different bad actors. You know, we I brought up a little bit around cryptocurrency, uh, but you just, you get these people because it is so new. People just don't have the knowledge around it, at least as much as they need to. And you get these bad actors coming in that are going to sell you these high returns. They're going to sell you these you know, low risk type options. And it's just, again, something that you got to be aware of. These new investment spaces, it's, or it's those spaces in my mind, also with the spaces of things that you think are out of your league or out of your expertise, because these scammers know this and they use it to their advantage. And they use a lot of buzzwords, a lot of words that, you might have heard here and there, but you don't understand, and they start piling them onto each other, and you're thinking, these people know what they're doing. These people know what they're talking about. I was just kind of winging it going in here, so these are somebody that I trust. So these new investment areas, these people in areas that you don't feel like you have expertise in are always uh, another area to have that red flag because if you're not comfortable with terminology it's very easy to be persuaded into that scam. And when you're getting into the investment space, or maybe you're already here, it's always imperative that you get your education up to the level you need to actually invest. And if you're looking for someone to help you, make sure that they're not just telling you what to do, but that they actually have the heart of a teacher to coin a Dave Ramsey phrase, but that they have the heart of a teacher to actually tell you uh, and to help you grow your knowledge so that not only are they telling you what to invest in, but you're actually understanding what you're investing in and can make decisions for yourself. Yeah, it does seem like anybody that does actually want to help somebody wants to teach them. They want to pass on their knowledge because it's something that they're passionate about and they want other people to be as passionate about that subject as they are. Another warning sign, Drew, is listening to someone or investing with someone that you actually have, haven't have met in person yet. And I think now that we're in the digital age, that this is probably more and more common. Yeah, this digital age is just going to be more and more prominent for sure. We're going to talk about crypto a little bit later in this episode. But that is an area where almost majority of the people want to be so decentralized that they're just anonymous. So for you to actually be able to trust these people, you have to be able to be educated, do your due diligence. And I think Previously, you probably saw that with dot com bubbles or like as a f telephone sales became big because it was somebody you didn't know. They were a smooth talker mm -hmm. and they put you in those high pressure situations too. So, meeting somebody you don't know can be a little difficult. And it's always a time for you to be able to step back and really ask some questions and get some more information. And if they're legit, they will have no problem doing that. This one specifically reminds me of the financial space on TikTok and more specifically around people that try to sell life insurance as the only retirement investment account. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm not against life insurance, uh, specific types of life insurance as all life insurance is created for someone, but there's a lot of people out there, specifically people that sell the insurance, you know, that is the key there, but people are trying to say that, Hey, this is the best option for retirement. And then they put together like the best case scenario and they sell it to people. And I, I think you just have to be aware that, Hey, you know, if it's too good, if it sounds too good, it probably is. And if you're listening it from someone on the internet that you haven't built a relationship with or you haven't connected with outside of just watching a few of their videos, that's probably a really big warning sign to 
take a step back and say, hey, you know what? Maybe I should find someone else to listen to. Yeah, that almost perfectly leads us into our next area, just using celebrity endorsements. These are people that you might have the facial recognition of, but you don't know who it is. And the people that tend to be selling these products, you don't know who they are. You don't get to see their face. And they like to end up having little pictures of that celebrity you might know, or they might be paying maybe an influencer right, right, just to pass on those type of projects. So there's, again, it's, it's somebody you don't necessarily know, know, and, but it's in your mind saying like, I feel comfortable with this person. I know it because I see him on TV. And then that's when you really have to say like, is that celebrity or that person actually involved in this by any means? And that's just going again saying it's time to get educated and do some due diligence on that project instead of clicking right on it and going right in with an investment. I would even expand this a little bit, Drew, and to say that celebrities that invest themselves into a certain thing and share that knowledge, you can't always follow suit. You know, you, you do have to make sure you know what you're investing in. And one thing that came to my mind, Drew, as you were talking is Jim Cramer, who is, you know, the host of Mad Money, I believe. And he's a big time uh, investment guy. Um, and he was talking a couple of months ago about Netflix. It's like, now's the time to buy Netflix. I'm buying Netflix. And then like a week later, Netflix earnings and stuff came out and it just tanked. And so, you know, you have those celebrities, you have those, those uh, very influential people that they may be doing something, but that doesn't necessarily mean you should. And so again, I mean, this probably Drew, is going to be a theme throughout this entire episode, but you have to make sure that you're investing into stuff that you know, you have to have the knowledge and the, I hate to use this, but like the education around it, but just really just understand what you're actually getting into and not just follow willy nilly, whoever uh, you trust and listen or watch and follow online or, you know, whatever celebrity uh, type of media that they're in. It's, it's better to just, you know, do your own, do your own it's, due diligence. It's, yeah. It's pretty funny. You end up bringing up like Jim Cramer and like Sean Hall. He said, he's buy on Netflix and it drops and, like a whole a huge social media finance movement is always saying inverse Kramer. So whatever <laughs> Kramer says, they're going to invest the opposite. And yeah. I think they've actually been doing fairly well on it. But there's another person I like to follow on Twitter, and he calls CNBC Cartoon Network. And his whole his whole thought is they're a big media company. They're like the faces that you feel like you can trust that give you the information every single day. But they're a for-profit company, so they want to be able to push headlines. And majority of the people that they get information from, not necessarily insider information, but some more conversations, are from people that were actually maybe investment firms or the actual companies, and they want to push a certain narrative. So if they're pushing that certain narrative, then it goes to the talking heads on media. And they don't necessarily what's going on. They're just relaying what they heard. So having that friendly face of a celebrity might feel comfortable, but it might not always be what you think. And more than likely, it probably isn't exactly what you think. And again, if it's too good to be true, it's because it most likely is. All right, Drew. So then our last warning sign is if someone is has really convincing promotional materials or maybe a very convincing website, you know, it, it looks very nice and neat. Um, that could be pen potentially be a warning sign. And also if you do go down the route of working with a certain type of company or person, if they're asking you to deposit funds into multiple different types of accounts, uh, per transaction, that might be a huge, you know, red flag and say, Hey, you know what? I, I actually don't want to invest with you or do business with you. And, you know, going to the depositing of the fund side of it, there are some scammers out there that will say, uh, we're so glad you want to come with us. You just send us, say, 200 bucks to get started, and then we'll be able to give you 400 bucks right back. And right off the top there, like just depositing that type of fund and getting some money right back right away doesn't really make any sense. And as far as depositing and say it's an offshore account and then you need to go through all these loops or they have to 
get like very specific information from you. There's those are all just these warning signs. So whenever you're having to like deposit funds and they tend to be peer to peer type of stuff too. So if they're not like offshore, it can be just, Hey, just click this link and Venmo me this, or, you know, send me this on, I don't know. It could be a check. It just tends to always be like peer to peer, and you don't really have that intermediary, and there's not as much of a trail behind it. If you're going to have someone invest your money for you, you have to make sure that you're going with someone that is certified by a governing body, uh, like a certified financial planner, for example, you know, or someone that has uh, has gone through uh, a series of tests. They are credentialed. They have to abide by certain rules. If you're truly looking for someone to help you in that way, make sure that they are certified and that they have your best interests at heart. Not someone that is just going to say, hey, you know, give me 200 bucks and I'll give you 400 bucks a month later or whatever it might be. Those are obviously something to stay far, far away from. That should bring us perfectly now into our actual examples. These are going to be some names that you've probably heard before, some scams you've heard before. Maybe you haven't, but we want to now that you have the warning signs you'll be able to see those warning signs actually when we're talking about these examples. And like the first one that we'd want to talk about saying we're more movie based would be pump and dumps. And very famous one would be like the Wolf of Wall Street and Justin Belfort. And these pump and dumps tend to be, say, a penny stock or a stock with a low float, which is saying you have low outstanding shares, so it doesn't take much money for these stocks to move. These people front load these companies, and then they promote the crap out of it. And as they get new, 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 or more and more investors into this, the stock will accelerate, go through the roof, and those people that are already front loaded on it sell when they decide to sell. It crashes that stock all the way down because there's not as many circulating shares and all those small retail investors that wanted to put money into that are now SOL because they weren't show or they weren't sure where this was gonna stop and they get FOMO, the fear of missing out, and they keep putting money in, money in, and they're buying mostly at the top because that's almost when they get the alerts of saying, you gotta invest into it. Look at it, it's already gone up. 20% in the last hour, the last day. So pump and dumps are probably one you've heard about and very common. And that's one that you definitely want to look out for. I always think that if you're hearing something that has done ex- extraordinarily well, you know, 50, 100, a thousand percent, you probably have missed all the gains at the end of the day. And like you said, Drew, is that when things, when the people that are pumping these types of investments up, when they're trying to get out, they can only get out when they can sell to others. And so unfortunately people get sucked in. They believe the hype. They believe the promotional materials. They believe that this is going to go straight to the moon and they come by in and Usually it's, well, more often than not, it is the retail investor that's getting crushed here, but they come in, the people pumping it, get out and the the investment just crashes and you just basically lose uh, your entire investment. With these, like I said, most of them tend to be penny stocks and that's just because they're a little bit less regulated than you would on like a top tier exchange, like say the NASDAQ uh, or the uh, New York Stock Exchange. So- when you're looking at these stocks, you before you buy into them, if you do, you want to be able to zoom out because mostly you'll see a flat line or decreasing, 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 decreasing graph of saying their company is going nowhere and it comes rocketing out of nowhere. And then normally within a day or two, it's back down to nothing and then just flat lines the rest of its lifespan for the most part. So that's one thing to look at if you get excited about one of these zoom out on the graph and that will paint a pretty good picture for you not that it's really a pump and dump but i can kind of expand this a little more just into general investing and that's when you if you're looking into invest into like mutual funds for example and again i talked a little earlier about my s p 500 baseline of eight to ten percent is kind of what you're going to see in investing in the stock market some mutual funds will be like hey you know i have gotten you know 
25, 30% the last three years, come invest in my fund. Where actually statistically, statistically it's shown that if you invest in those types of funds, those high investments are going to be in the past. You most likely won't see them and they're going to underperform going forward. And so just, you know, try to expand, you know, we're going to talk about some kind of silly stuff that you might be like, Hey, you know what? I would never fall for that, but you can kind of extrapolate it out to broader investing uh, education. And that's just one that I'm kind of passionate about because a lot of mutual funds do say, Hey, you know, I've done way better than the S and P 500 index. But then if you catch up with them 15 years later, more than likely than not, statistically speaking, they're not even going to be around. And so you just have to keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah. And if I could add any more into this little pump and dump section, it's pretty similar to a pump and dump, but with a little bit difference. And it's called a boiler room scam. And <clears throat> maybe we can just have this as a completely different section for scams, but the boiler room, it actually, as I said, movie based, there's a movie called The Boiler Room. <clears throat> and what you have is a group of investors or the people, I should say, the people selling the stock. So like brokers, but not actually uh, brokers. And what they do is they call for a bunch of investors into this new up and coming company, whether it's publicly traded or not. And they get these people's money by showing them, look at their website, look at their building, and they have all this fake facade around this actual investment. And when they get the money from all these different investors, they shut down the website, they shut down everything else. And if you actually were to actually say Google map, their actual address, it could just be a shed in the middle of nowhere. So if you've ever heard of like a boiler room, that's what it is. It's people pumping and getting money from companies that do not exist. They get the money, dissolve and move on to the next scam. I was going to bring up cryptocurrency is because this kind of happens in that space, but I'll save it because we'll get there. We'll get there. I just, I got to, I got to stay uh, patient here. So Drew, what's our next, what's our next scam category here that you've put together? Uh, another big name that people are probably aware of is Ponzi schemes or the pyramid scheme. And you know, if I can go anything back to movie based, there's actually another. There's actually a movie about this. Yeah, it's yeah. called the Polka. Uh, let me see here, the Polka King, and it's about a Polish polka singer that had say a little knick knop or knick knack shop, and he was running behind on some payments. So then he went out for some investors and said, "Hey, if you just give me this money, I'll give you this much back at the end of it." And then he ended up seeing that worked well. So then that was one of those times where you see the low risk, high returns. He was offering these people like 10, 12, 15% guaranteed. And then he just got more and more and more investors in. He continues his polka stuff. And as he found out, he got deeper, deeper in. He didn't have enough investors to pay these returns and the Ponzi scheme ended up collapsing on itself. And that's what these pyramid schemes do. You need more and more and more and more people to come in to fund the entire Ponzi scheme. And they tend to fizzle out as they get to a certain size. You can't fund what these returns are anymore. And then they are exposed for the pyramid scheme that they are. It all comes down to just returns that are just too good to be true. And I think that's just, again, something that you just have to be aware of. If, you know, if you have your baseline and you're like, hey, you know, this is way better and it's risk free, quote unquote. Yeah, it's probably not the case. And more than likely, it's probably either a Ponzi scheme or some sort of other scam that we're, we'll talk about today. So this brings us into the next list, and it would be going back to the celebrity endorsements that was in one of our red flag areas. And, you know, as we're going to get more into the crypto talk, the celebrity endorsement things tend to be a pretty big thing now with social media. And everybody has influencers. Everybody likes to look up to these celebrities. Uh, if we could go back to another Netflix show. Yeah, Fire I like Fat. I love the theme, Drew. The, the theme is going to be all about <laughs> shows. And uh, Fire Fest, not that it was necessarily an investment scam. And actually, I look back on it. I think it actually might be an investment scam because they had these celebrity influencers showing this big party, this big 
concert that was going to be happening, promising the biggest and the fanciest things. They got all this money from these people, and they ended up realizing that there wasn't that much money to do what they actually wanted to do. They didn't have the infrastructure, and they ended up having these small tents and these bologna sandwiches for their meals. So that was one area where they promoted with celebrities this big, beautiful idea, this cool concert to go to. They got investors to get into it with them to show how great this concert is going to be, how great their returns are going to be. And it ended up falling apart on itself. And if it wasn't for the big celebrity endorsement, I don't think that Firefest would ever have gotten as big as it actually was. And to put it in like more tangible, in a more tangible way, I think of, I look at like the influencer space. I, we kind of talked about it already uh, in the warning signs, but you know, there are people out there that are going to build a community and then try to sell you on some sort of scam. And so I, my, my general thought is don't trust anyone online. That's not offering you educational material or investing in knowledge for free or if you're paying for like a course or something like that, but don't go out and trust someone because they blew up on social media because they live this lavish lifestyle, you know, specifically like Drew, like when you're in your early twenties, maybe like 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there when you're like, Oh man, like I can get rich tomorrow. Right. Like we're all young and dumb right? at some point. Uh, some of us still might be young and dumb, but you know, we will say who, <laughs> but at the end of the day, like if it's, it's, if it's, too fast to get rich. If you get rich quickly, if it's not a slow, steady wealth building process, it's probably too good to be true. And unfortunately, you see this a lot in in the online space because people are trying to make money and they're trying to sell you on these investment, whether it's an investment itself or you know telling you to go invest in some other type of thing that maybe they didn't create, but they are promoting. Uh, is this something that you need to avoid? Yeah. I think one of the biggest examples that you can see of this would be if you're online and you see this, say a seminar for, for sale, or you see this new NFT or crypto project that's just getting launched, or you see this new just investment product or project coming out they tend to say what it is as like makes it really nice and cool, but then they just slap on a picture of a celebrity that you would know that would potentially be in the similar type of area. So they don't necessarily say this celebrity endorses this, but your mind tricks yourself of seeing a picture with a celebrity and saying, wow, this celebrity is part of this project. I trust it. I'm going to put my money into it. You brought up online seminars and that kind of transitions us to the next one. And that's investment seminars. You know, specifically when I think about investment seminars, I go instantly to real estate. Real estate is a big one. You know, it's kind of funny. If I look back at one of our older podcasts, we had James Griner on and he kind of, he went to one of these seminars and not that he necessarily got scammed, but these are kind of how they roll out of they draw you in, you go to the seminar, and then it's like the seminar is just a seminar for the next seminar. So then you pay money to go to the next seminar, and then they upsell you their program, and then they upsell you something else. And most of the information you probably could get for free on the internet. And uh, lucky enough for James, he was able to get some good information out of that. But those are some of those type of investment seminars that you have to watch out for the ones that just want to keep reeling you in upselling you on things upselling you on things get you into course and there's really no value behind it or they don't have the credentials they say they are and you end up just throwing your money down the drain this one's really hard though right because you should pay for education you should pay to build your knowledge but it's very challenging when you're looking at whether it's an online seminar or in-person seminar and so i think you have to look at okay what are the testimonials you know what are these what are these people's resumes? Like, have they actually done what they're teaching? And then is there anyone that I actually trust that can, you know, vouch for them that can say, Hey, actually, no, you need to trust these people and what they teach. And so, you know, 
maybe it's just a little extra due diligence. Maybe it's a little understanding of who these people are when going to out and buy a seminar. Because I, I don't think that seminars are a bad thing. I actually think the opposite. I think they're fantastic. And then you can argue that they might even be better than going to a more formal education at the end of the day, specifically when you look at, at investing. But you have to make sure that whoever you are paying money to go learn information from, first know what the seminar is going to teach you. Understand if they're going to try to upsell you and then know that, you know what their background is, what the resume is, and then is there anyone that you trust that has gone through it or that can vouch for them and say, hey, you know what, this is definitely worth it. What was that one movie line of like, we have the technology? Oh, I and have no idea. <laughs> I can't think of what I maybe it, I'm making it up in my mind, but I swear that's a movie line. And if it is, or even if it's fake, I'm going to use it because it's one of those things where we have the technology, we have the internet. So when Kevin's talking about testimonials, it's such a great way to just quick Google search what these people's names are and check out what the reviews are and if things are actually worth it or not. And then you can kind of really formulate a good opinion if it's something that you want to move forward with or just kind of step back from a little bit. You know what, Drew? Speaking of we have the technology and also a very corny transition. Our next thing is crypto projects. And if you've listened to our past podcast episode, you and I, you know that both Drew and I love the crypto world. We love this new scene, but there is so many poor investment or there's a ton of scams out there right now in this world, aren't there, Drew? It's the wild, wild west in the crypto world right now. And it can be an intimidating area and it can be a scary area. But right now, being the wild, wild west, there are a few big scams that you tend to see right now. One, if we're going back to the movie theme, if you've seen Squid, if you ever seen Squid Game, they came out with a Squid Coin after that or Squid Token. Uh, and what they did is what they call a rug pull in the crypto. So they create a project, they create a social presence, they create hype, they get all these people to put their money into it and their liquidity pool. So this is the amount of money that's circulating through their project is pretty much held in one wallet or like a developer's wallet. And then once they get to amount of money that they want, they shut down the entire project. They drain all the liquidity out of there. The price will drop to zero and nobody can sell that amount of tokens that they purchase because there's zero liquidity anymore. So rug pulls are a big one. That Squid Game was probably the most prominent one that people heard about because it was something that went from like pennies, maybe less than a penny, to like was it like twenty or thirty dollars. It had a market cap larger than Bitcoin. Yeah. It was crazy. <laughs> at, at, at one point and then it dropped to zero within like 30 seconds so that was one huge huge rug pull uh, but that's one of the areas in the crypto that you end up seeing uh, the second one is as the crypto world is more and more decentralized there's like this web 3 is kind of where they're they're calling this new crypto ver and metaverse stuff is web 3 they want it to be decentralized they don't want to have people in charge like a central bank they don't want to have, say, like a Facebook having all of their data. And with that, you would have, say, your decentralized wallet. And they get these things that are called airdrops. With everything in blockchain, you have a public ledger. So that means like you could go out on Google right now. You could look at a certain, say, like a say your Bitcoin, and you could go and find wallet addresses in there. Because everybody just shows all their transactions. So they will copy and paste these. They'll send fake tokens to these wallets. And then you'll be sitting there. Out of nowhere, you'll say, Whoa, I just got uh, X amount of this token, X amount of this coin. But if you actually go in and click and use that, they tend to be a phishing scam where they will go in, they'll interrupt your entire wallet, and they'll steal all your funds out of there. So that's one kind of scary thing. So if you are in the crypto world or new to it and have a wallet and you get popped in something that you've never dealt with, stay away from it. Try to hide it. Don't interact with it. And that kind of goes back to one of our red flags. Like if something pops up out of the blue 
and the other warning signs of with people you don't deal with normally. That one's scary, especially if you are brand new to the crypto scene. You really, if you don't understand what even a wallet is, or maybe potentially you don't understand what all the different tokens are and how you know this whole ecosystem operates, you can lose everything in the blink of an eye. And you know that's really scary, specifically when uh, you're getting into this new space and if you're putting a lot, throwing a lot of money around. So. Make sure that you're just very much aware of what you're doing, specifically in the crypto world. You know, I have some of my thoughts around those altcoins and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, just make sure that you are very aware of what you are investing in. And more specifically, you know, in these newer types of spaces, it's always a good thing to not invest something that you could not lose because it is a very high risk uh, and high reward seen in the crypto space right now and if there's any other red flag that add on top of this one so like a lot of these if you do have a crypto scam they tend to have a bunch of these red flags but the next biggest red flag you have on there is like a high pressure situation and these are if say you have a project that's upgrading to a new version or they're adding a new feature to their project there tends to be hiccups because almost nothing really transitions perfectly even in say the corporate world if you're putting new software in so they will capitalize on this they will make fake twitter profiles that make it seem like they're the project so if you had abc project they'll say abc support team and then when you're saying what happened to this feature it wasn't working well they'll comment on there and say hey if you're having issues just dm us and then that's when they tend up tend to act like they're helping you they get your wallet address and once they get your wallet address they'll send you uh something to click on or something to interact with and when you interact with that that's when they have control of your wallet and they take all the funds that you had in there out of there it's just devastating too because specifically in the crypto world once that's gone it's gone. Like there's, there's not a, a support team you can call to get a refund. It, it's gone, and that's you know the unfortunate nature of the crypto space in its current form. But Drew, let's move on to the next one because this one is kind of interesting, and I was a little shocked when you threw it on the list. But the romance baiting. Tell us, tell us what the heck this one is all about. Because when I think about investment scams, I'm not thinking about romance by any stretch of the imagination yeah so i think there's some smaller ones in here that you might hear as if say you're on like tinder and you have somebody catfishing you and saying hey if you think i'm pretty just send me 30 dollars." and you know not necessarily that's investment but that's kind of like where some people hear about that or they uh kind of just get catfished into saying just send me this for a little bit and uh, I'll give you your money back. Or I'm in a tough predicament. Don't you love me? Just send me this money. And if since this was a movie content themed episode, there is actually a show called the Tinder Swindler. I believe it's on <laughs> Netflix. And I think guy, we're true. I think we're gonna have to put together a list of just all the movies that come out of this episode and put that out on our socials, just so someone can have it and be like, "Hey, you know what? I'm gonna watch all these and I'm gonna learn all about the investment scam world." There's actually a lot we've already said in this episode. It's pretty crazy. Like they just pop into my mind. Like I said, I'm very intrigued by scams, so I tend to watch a lot of scam shows. Uh, but anyway, so this Tinder swindler, he did this romance baiting. And it was like between that and kind of a Ponzi scheme hybrid. So what he would do is he would get a strong emotional connection with somebody on a dating app. He'd almost never really call them by their name. He'd call them babe or something very generic. And this is because he was doing this to, you know, tens to hundreds of girls at a time. And he would get emotional connection he would say he's in a tough predicament. I need this much money. But he made it seem like he was this very rich guy. He lived the craziest lifestyle. So they felt like they would get the money back. And he would get this, he'd make these girls take out these huge lo loans that they couldn't afford. He'd send them to this person. And then he would take money from somebody else he did that to and send a portion of that to that person. Say, hey, I'll give you the rest. 
this day because I'm still working on a project. And then he would just manipulate these women into thinking he loved them. He was in this big trouble. He was this extremely, extremely rich, exclusive guy that like the mob was after. So he had to be in hiding. That's like he wasn't reaching back out to them and couldn't send stuff. And then he was doing like wire fraud on top of that saying, hey, this is how much I sent you. Don't you see the receipt here? So that romance baiting, it doesn't necessarily seem like an investment scam because uh, they're not really investing to look anything back. But they take a significant amount of your well-earned money and credit out of your hands, which I think would fit into a personal finance podcast. I'm going to try to pull something out of here because one, I love the fact that this is included because it is very entertaining, at least in my eyes. But you know, you can kind of extrapolate from this in such a way of from just the more of the emotional aspect. So if, for example, you might in your life have someone come up to you and say, Hey, can you invest, you know, a thousand dollars into me and I'll give you back your money when I, after I get my business up or, you know, I'm starting this new crypto project or I'm starting real estate company or whatever it might be. And if you have that emotional bond, they can kind of play it. Not saying that, you know, everyone's malicious, but there are bad actors out there that might take you for granted. And so you just have to be vigilant. And, you know, we've talked about this in the past year about, you know, trading with emotions or investing with emotions. And when you get into investing, it has to be an emotion less activity. You have to be able to look at whatever investment you're getting into, crunch the numbers, understand the risk versus the reward. And if it's and if it fits within your risk appetite, regardless of, or if it doesn't fit in your risk appetite, regardless of who is actually offering the investment, uh, then you have to act accordingly and take the emotion out of it. You know, it's, it's easy for me to say that behind this microphone and behind this camera, but you, you just really have to, you have to separate yourself from the emotions, specifically if you have someone in your life that you truly trust, you know, if it's a loved one, even if it's a family member, you know, all that stuff, you, you just have to take a step back and say, you know what, hey, does this actually fit into my long-term vision? Yeah, that emotion stuff is crazy and that emotion stuff is scary because if like you said you get to a point where you really trust somebody you really love this person and it's an unfortunate truth that there's some people that manipulate so much and they have no remorse no remorse for it that they have no problem taking that money from you and it really affects that person and you know i don't know what I would do in a situation like that. I would be extremely rattled and I'm sure you just, I, th I think it's probably something you just slowly get into and you just don't realize it's happening while it's happening. And I'm sure they do their best to manipulate and, uh, you know, get people that don't have much friends or support group, because I think if you have that around you, they might say, Hey, you're acting really different or doesn't what he's doing seem really strange to you. Uh, so, but that's the emotional stuff is extremely tough because it takes, unfortunately, normally bad experiences to get stronger emotionally. So we got two more. We got two more to go through here. What's, what's the next one on the list? The next two here are ones you maybe not hear much. We just kind of want to add them in here. So the next one would be a gold scam. And pretty much the reason I wanted to add this one is with the value of the dollar going down. There tends to be some people that want to do some doomsday prepping and they maybe think gold might be the best currency if the dollar goes to nothing. And so there are some gold scam, st scams that can be out there. One could be somebody wanting you to invest into an actual mine, but they know it's either they don't have the mine or it's a mine that has nothing in it. It's completely worthless. So they can make it seem like I think they'll just keep toying on. I think it's going to keep getting gold. I know it's going to get gold. I just need more money from you just so we can dig this certain area. And that's where it's going to be. And then maybe they have a little bit of gold. So they see, this is how much we got. If we extrapolate it, that's going to be how much money you can make on your investment. And then they just keep doing that, keep leading you on. And you keep feeding money into these types of projects. Another way of doing it, or another way these scams happen is if you actually wanted to buy physical gold. I think if you wanted to be somebody that wanted to prep and doomsday, I'm not saying that in a negative way by any means, 
But if you wanted to buy physical gold coins, they might say, if you wanted to buy this, we'll hold it in our vault for you. And we can have it there. And if you decide you wanted to sell it, we'll sell it for you. We'll give you the gains. No worries. Or if you want us to do it automatically, if you see the gold going up to here, we'll just send you that money. And, you know, partially it seems weird that you'd want to do that if you wanted to have physical gold. Uh, but they can find ways to talk you into that with high pressure situations. Somebody you don't know could be a good talker and they say it's super, super secure in our vault. But after you send them their money, they never actually purchase that gold. It never goes into the vault and you never get your money back. And you probably never hear from them again, if we're going to be really honest. Uh, but again, it's just doing your due diligence, making sure that whoever you're doing business or investing with is actually a viable company or a viable plan or whatever it might be. And specifically if you're entrusting them with your hard earned money. All right, Drew, what's our last scam? Last one is Forex scam. So Forex is like foreign, foreign exchange, uh, trading or currency trading. So you'd be trading, uh, you know, dollars for euros, et cetera. And if you get more into the rabbit hole of, investing you'll come across this type of trading and there's a lot of people out there that tend to be these types of gurus and you'll see them a lot with promotional ads uh email campaigns etc and what they'll want you to do is for one join their little group so you're paying like almost a membership to get behind the curtain and then they show off this lifestyle like I make so much money. Look at the cars I drive. Look at where I'm at. I'm trading from uh, Dubai right now. And they'll say, if you want, you can just give me your money and I'll invest it for you. He's like, this is, I'm just teaching, the membership was just teaching you the basics of Forex trading. But if you actually want to make the money, just give me your money. I'll give you a percentage of my gains. Look how much I have. And it'll be pretty much guaranteed that you're going to be getting returns back. And that's one of those red flags, again, of some you don't really know, kind of a celebrity. You're depositing funds somewhere else, and they're saying you're going to get high returns. So there's a lot of red flags in some type, in like in a Forex trading type of scam. I just always think that if you're going to give anyone your money to invest for you, you have to make sure that they're certified by some governing body because uh, those rules exist for a reason. Don't give your money to some you know, scum overseas that's promising you, you know, a thousand X returns or whatever it might be. So just make sure that when you're, you know, you're going out and investing with someone, it's someone that you can trust, someone that's certified and someone that has, you know, made a career out of it and isn't just selling you some ridiculous returns because, you know, unfortunately that happens all the time. So Drew, this was, this is an awesome list. There's, you know, there's a ton of information out there. You know, we probably just scratched the surface of the number of investors scams that truly exist out in the personal finance and in the investment world. You know, we, our last little section here is how to not get scammed, but I feel like we talked about that throughout this entire episode. Since we've kind of been talking about it, let's just have you go down the list and that's kind of like a recap of what we've talked about and then that's just yeah. those... That's how, how would you, how would you go down the list? You're the one that threw it together. I like it. And I'll add, you know, if I have any extra key takeaways for, for our listener here. Okay. Since I have it on the list, I'm going to turn my eyes over for anybody on YouTube. I'm going to be reading the list. So ways that we put together, like <clears throat> not getting scammed or verifying your credentials, adopt a mindset that there's no such thing as easy money. Don't follow the crowd, refuse to rush to a decision, never feel obligated and ask for documentation. So when we're recapping those, it's really verifying credentials. You want to be able to know who this is that's you're trying to invest with. Uh, there's no such thing as easy money. This is saying if these art returns are so guaranteed, it doesn't make sense to me. That's kind of where your mindset has to be being like, that doesn't pass a smell test. Don't follow the crowd. That could be some type of a pump and dump where Everybody's getting into it when it's already shot up. And by that time, it's probably too late. 
you want to refuse to rush the decision. Those are in those high intense moments where they're saying you have to make the decision right now. If you don't make the decision on the phone call, then you're going to lose out on the opportunity. That's working on your emotions. You want to be able to not put yourself into those rush decisions. Never feel obligated. This is another one of those emotional grabs is if somebody's saying you should do this, you don't have to have it in the pit of your stomach saying, I really think I should. You should be able to take a step back and really look at the situation and see if it's the right decision on paper, not necessarily that you just feel guilty for not doing it. Um, and then last, ask for documentation. I think this one Kevin brought up a lot during uh, during the episode where you really want to have your Kevin's rule of thumb of 48 hours, ask for documentation, know who it is you're talking about. Maybe go on to the internet and try to figure out who this person actually is, if they're a good or bad actor. And you know, the only other thing I would add on here is it's okay to take risks uh, in your investment world. Make sure you set up your base, your foundation, and then to go out into some more of these non-traditional investments. I know we're talking about scams here, and I totally agree with everything we talked about, how not to get scammed, but make sure that if you are going out into more alternative investment type world or maybe higher risk world, make sure you're investing with money that it doesn't matter if you lose it and that won't impact your long-term financial goals. Cause then if you do end up getting scams, because like we said in the beginning of the episode, it's more likely going to get more sophisticated over time, not less. If you do end up getting scammed, at least you're getting scammed out of money that you can lose. And you're not going to rely on that money for things like retirement or, you know, some of those bigger long-term goals. Yeah. And even talking about like alternative investments, you'll see, you know, we talk about crypto in here and, you know, we talked about precious metals such as gold. And really, if you're looking at some of these big investors into it, it's really only one to three percent of their portfolios. So you can show you can see that there is still some skepticism into the big money that's going in there, because if they were 100 percent confident in all these new alternative new investment styles, they'd be having a much more percentage of their portfolio in these type of investments. All right, Drew. And actually, if you're watching out on YouTube, you can probably see some bags under my, we kind of had a rearrange our recording schedule this week. It's a little later on Wednesday, but that's okay. Cause I'm fired up to still be in the studio. I, you know, I absolutely love doing this each and every week, but you know, with that, Drew, what's going on over in your neighborhood this week? This past week was Memorial uh, weekend. So I guess first of all, we have to say we thank to all like the service members and all the fallen soldiers for helping for our freedom because we, I mean, that's point of Memorial Weekend. It's not for long weekend of vacation. We want to be remembering the people that allow us to be able to be on video today. But uh, I was out at the lake for Memorial Weekend. We've had a tradition going up to a buddy's cabin or you know who cody's yep. you've cabin's been up yeah, there absolutely <laughs> yeah and so i was up there and i was kind of poking the bear with uh jeff and it kind of like going back and forth back and forth at, at like the fire he's like there's too much wood on there i'm like there's not enough wood on there he's like there's too much wood on there I'm like there's not enough so like i'd put wood on he'd take it off and uh there's just a fire poker hanging around and somebody else must have just been uh, heating that up, not to brand somebody, but just for fun. And <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, knowing what goes on up there, it could have very well been to brand someone. <laughs> it could have been. And so Jeff had it in his hand, not realizing how hot it was. And he was kind of like trying to poke the wood I've been trying to put on and then kind of poke me. And it was like all funny games. And then I was like, oh, I think it can't be that hot. So I grabbed the end of it. And <laughs> uh, if anybody on YouTube, I have a bandaged Jeez. hand. There's a little blister here, but the big one is <laughs> right there. So I burnt my hand pretty good. Feel a little stupid about it. It's a little tough to uh, do things with your right hand having <laughs> blisters on it. But maybe I can put a reel out or a 
post some pictures on our podcast web page for I know it's not necessarily personal finance stuff, but if you kind of want to follow us and you want to see how bad this blister is, I'm more than willing to post it out on social media. So let us know in the comments if that is something I that you want. I am so interested to see it now. I wish you didn't have it bandaged up because well, maybe I'll have to get you send me a picture or something in the morning or I'll wait for you to put it on our socials because I can only imagine that thing's got to just be swollen. Yeah, I'll send you some pictures tonight if you want. And then uh, I'll try to put some on maybe socials. Uh, maybe maybe when this releases so then people have know what to go and look for. Yeah, so that was, that was my weekend. Uh, fun weekend. Uh, thankful weekend. And... I feel like an idiot type of weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Which more than likely, more likely than not happens when you go up uh, to the lake on Memorial weekend. But hey, who you know, it's all in fun. Usually you don't burn your hand off, but you know, that's, that, that's not. It's like the second time I've had bad burns on my hands. I tried <laughs> making bread in a Dutch oven and I pulled the top off easily with, or like a normal person with a hot pad. And then when I wanted to put the lid back on, I forgot to put the hot pad back on my hand and I burnt the crap out of my fingers and I had huge blisters on them. Uh, (laughs) And that was like probably only like a year or two ago. And now I have like another big blister. I sent the the picture to my brother. He was like, you really need to stop doing that to your hand. I think, I think that's trying to tell you something there, Drew. I think you uh, maybe need to think, a couple more seconds before doing things in your life. <laughs> before knowing what things are hot or not. I remember that Dutch oven when I, I like literally grabbed the lid with my hand. I think it was my right hand too. And I lifted it up. And like by the time I got to like the top of my lift, I was like, holy moly, that's really, really hot. <laughs> but I was like, I couldn't drop it because it's ceramic and I would have yeah. broke it. So then I just slowly put it back down. And I was like. Uh, so you're telling me that there's some like delay from your hand burning to your mind being like, oh, my hand is burning. I'm be honest with you, I was one a one hundred percent sober on the crock pot one, Dutch oven <laughs> one. <laughs> we won't talk about the fire stick one. No comment. <laughs> so yeah, anything good over at the your neighborhood? Not a whole lot going on, but I did read an article today that I was kind of just blown away. And I was going to, I thought about saving this for a future episode, but it's kind of short lived. Uh, but maybe we'll draw it into another episode in the future, but who knows? But the article I believe was by CNBC and it said that there was a study that was done and it said that households that made over $250,000 per year one third of those households live paycheck to paycheck. And I just, I read that and I was just like blown away because when you think about getting paid $250,000, you just, you just think you probably honestly think that you just like can buy anything that you want that you just like set up. Cause don't get me wrong. 250 K is a lot of money. And so when I read that, that one third of households are living paycheck to paycheck now, and they tried to wrap it into inflation and all of that. And I'm sure inflation had, has some impact to it, but the fact that, you know, people making that much money can still be living paycheck to paycheck tells you that there's such a big gap in the personal finance space. And so Drew, it gives me hope that, you know, what we're doing here each and every week is hopefully going to try to help some people out with it. But yeah, I just wanted to bring that up because I thought it was just so fascinating that, you know, even people that make so much money in their salary, they can still live paycheck to paycheck and still struggle. That's a really interesting statistic. I, I It'd be even more interesting to see like what the demographics or like the jobs that these people had and like the people that the ones that were living page, paycheck, if there's like any correlation in like their type of jobs or the education that they had to do for their jobs that really put them there, all that type of stuff would be pretty interesting to see on top of that. And I know you brought up inflation Uh, on our Instagram today. I put out a reel. I wanted to kind of see what the buying power was for like the dollar. And I just used 75,000 for an example, like your salary and Putting that in from April of 2021 to April of 2022, so like a year difference, if you made that $75,000 that year before, you would have to make, it's like it's like 81200 81, somewhere in that realm 
just to live like the exact same way. So like you hear percentage of like the CPI and we've, our, we've already had our comments on what CPI and everything is, but since that's what people go off of, you hear that number, you hear that percentage, you hear it's high, but when you actually put it into perspective, like you have to make, you should, would have had to have a raise of almost $6,200 year over year just to live the exact same way you're living before. So like when you're thinking, Oh, $6,200 raise, that's just a break even like that. You can't really go out and buy anything more with that. You don't have like that extra money really in your pocket. Cause your buying power decreased by that much year over year. And I just, that one kind of blew me away. That, I mean, that's a good way to phrase it though. Like you do think like when I know like you're probably for people that actually get raises, which is not everyone and probably is a fraction of people, you know, it's probably typically around like one and a half to 3%, 3% being on the higher end, one and a half percent, maybe being on more of the lower end. And if that's true, I'm kind of pulling these out of thin air, kind of have some background around it. But if those numbers are true, and inflation, let's just say, is eight percent year over year. You're losing, you know, five to six and a half percent of your spending power, and that's just to live the same exact life. And so, while inflation is very impactful right now, uh, really the whole point of the story is that it doesn't matter what uh, end of the income spectrum you are in, you can make good decisions to get yourself out of living paycheck to paycheck and things like buying brand new vehicles every couple of years and having those high car payments, having student loans, how having too big of a house, having credit card debt, all of that can really add up. And it doesn't matter how much money you actually make. If you continue to make those types of decisions, you're going to be in financial trouble. And so you have to kind of get the, the liability side to get more accounting terms out there, the liability side, the debt side down. And it's not just getting your income up. Well, that is super important too. I think that's a great wrap up. I don't have much more to add to that (laughs) because you did it so well. So I think I can at least wrap up this episode because I think it's probably getting a little bit long for some of the listeners. Uh, But anyways, that wraps up another week of the Neighborhood Money podcast. We talked all about these investment scams, things to look out for, types of scams, how you can help yourself to not get scammed. And if you've made it this far, we want to thank you again for listening to the Neighborhood Money Podcast. If you want to hear more information like this, just give us a subscribe, give us a follow, give us some feedback because we want to continue to deliver is best content and it's as great content as we can and we can't do that without the neighbors like you so with all that said i want to thank you again and we will see you next week in the neighborhood 